In this episode of the Community Link, we visit Mesker Park Zoo to learn about one of their new animals on exhibit. We learn about the Mayor's Substance Abuse Task Force, look at the EVSC's Extended Daycare Center, and finish the program with a sit-down interview with the EVSC's Superintendent, Dr. David Smith. Senior reporter David Bland visited Mesker Park Zoo recently to learn about their new Indian rhino, Rupert. Hi, I'm David Bland here with Dr. Sue Lindsay, the animal curator at Messer Park Zoo, here to tell us a little about the new rhino, Rupert. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I always appreciate the opportunity to share about our animals and our conservation programs. Yeah, yeah, and can you tell us a little about the new rhino that we just now got and kind of how Messer Park Zoo got it? Rupert is an Indian rhino, also known as a greater horned rhino, one-horned rhino and he's part of a species survival program with the Association of, of Aquariums and Zoos and honestly uh, he came to us from the Oklahoma City Zoo where he was born. You mentioned that there are a couple hundred Indian rhinos. Do you happen to know if they're endangered? Indian rhinos are listed as vulnerable so there's a couple hundred in captivity here in the United States and Europe and also in uh, India and Nepal where they come from but they're listed as vulnerable because in the wild there's thought to only be at the most 3,500. Can you tell us how old Rupert is and if there's any special meals that he has to eat? Rupert is about three and a half years old now and what his diet, the amount of diet he'll receive will change over um, as he ages but right now he gets a bale of hay a day three pounds of a special diet, of a special pelleted diet, uh, produce, so he likes lettuce and carrots and various things like that, and then also some supplements that are given to him. Um, there isn't a special formula per se, but um, we try and give him things in the amount that will keep him growing and healthy. What training is required for the job of taking care of Rupert? Uh, our zookeepers all have at least a bachelor's degree in animal experience elsewhere before they are hired on here. But in this business, it's a fairly small business and folks have bachelor's degrees, some masters and PhDs to be zookeepers in, across the U.S. How has Rupert adapted to the Messer Park Zoo? When Rupert first came here, he's, he's too big for us to put him in, a, in another quarantine space, so he quarantines in this barn. And any animal that comes in and has to be quarantined, special um, precautions taken for 30 days to make sure they're not bringing in something and passing that on to our exhibit animals. Um, during that time frame, he had two keepers taking care of him and Meichi at all times so that we could keep everything separate. And it took him a little time to adapt to everything. He was kind of scared of everything to begin with. Um, it was a whole new experience, first time away from his mom. But he's doing really well now. Can you tell me a little about the other rhino that we have besides Rupert? The other rhino that we have is a female. Her name is Meichi. Um, she's actually an, an orphan. Um, one of the problems with rhinos is that they're often poached or killed for their horn, which is made out of hair and thought to be very important for use in um, medicines, particularly Chinese herbal medicines. So the adults are killed and the horn is cut off. And that's exactly what happened to Meichi's mother. So she was found as an orphan, brought into captivity in India, in, excuse me, in Nepal, and then eventually came to the United States for as a breeding animal. Um, she has had three young in the past. One survived, a female that's gone on to have a lot of other calves. But um, Meichi is also pretty famous because one of the things she likes to do for enrichment is paint. Um, you put some dots of paint on a, on a uh, piece of paper and then she'll move it around with her lips and create images of herself and who knows what else. Um, and then when Rupert came, uh, she's certainly been with males before um, and they both made noises back and forth. They seem to be getting along pretty well, um, spend some time grooming each other, but they've not been together um, in the same enclosure as of yet. And in the future, do you expect them to actually be in like the same area together, or are you kind of keeping them separate? 
Yeah, we don't plan on breeding them, so we're probably not going to put them together. We'll just kind of see how they do over time and whether we need to do that. And we just want to thank you for taking your time out and talking about Rupert and Mechi, and we just really want to thank you for that, and we appreciate you coming. No, we very much appreciate having you show interest in them, and thank you very much for having me. Up next, we have a segment over Evansville Mayor Lloyd Winnicke's Substance Abuse Task Force. Hello, I'm Dr. William Wooten, and I'm chairman of the Mayor's Substance Abuse Task Force. I came to Evansville in 1977 as a family physician, and I was later certified in addiction medicine, and also uh, had 20 years of experience in treating addictions at Welburn Hospital's Mulberry Center. Shortly after Mayor Winnicky took office, uh, he formed the Mayor's No Meth Task Force, which was focused on addressing the issue of meth labs in the Evansville area. When we came into office in 2012, the city of Evansville was really, really known around the state and around our region for having more meth labs than just about any city in the area. So we started uh, the No Meth Task Force and the objective of that task force was to uh, decrease the number of meth labs in our community and we were able to do that uh, uh, over a period of time because we had a lot of community outreach, uh, we had a lot of community engagement and involvement and that really helped raise the awareness to the extent that police and firefighters and other first responders were able to crack down and reduce, in fact, the number of meth labs we have in the city. So uh, we still have a meth problem. We don't have as big a problem with meth labs. Meth labs were causing significant problems with fires, explosions, children's needs, environmental pollution, and so forth. Uh, so the task force was focused more on the lab issue and not meth use in, its, in and of itself. Over the years after that task force was formed, we uh, were successful with a variety of sta strategies involving law enforcement, policymakers, and so forth, and meth labs diminished in the Evansville area. In 2012, Mayor Winnicke redirected the task force to take a broader look at things and we renamed ourselves the Mayor's Substance Abuse Task Force. Uh, composed primarily of the same people from law enforcement, fire department, uh, children's services, various treatment centers around the community, hospitals, uh, neighborhood associations, property owners, and prevention specialists in the Evansville area. Uh, since becoming the Mayor's Nomad Task Force, We've had a number of initiatives. We've developed a website, and the, we have the goal of engaging the Evansville community in acknowledging, understanding, and addressing the issues of substance abuse. The website uh, has four primary pillars, uh, knowledge, prevention, treatment, and recovery. Uh, since our inception, we've also had one specific project, and that was to increase the availability of services to concerned significant others, people who are living with or concerned about a loved one with an addiction or substance use disorder. Uh, we trained 40 mental health professionals a month or so ago in a process called CRAFT, Community Reinforcement and Family Training. And CRAFT is a process that enables the concerned significant other to intervene in a positive, compassionate way with a loved one to get them to enter treatment. Opioid use has been a significant concern over the past few years, and opioids are a cause of a significant number of premature uh, deaths in young people, uh, unexpectedly and certainly newsworthy and tragic for the family members involved. Uh, the opioids are not the only problem that the task force is looking to address. Uh, actually, alcohol is still the number one and most prevalent problem in our community with law enforcement issues, child care issues, health care issues, accidents, injuries, and, uh, and so forth. Opioids are a significant concern. Uh, meth is a continued concern, and other drugs of abuse are a continued concern. You know, before we can address the problem of substance use in the Evansville area, we have to get our arms around 
Uh, how big of a problem is it? Uh, how many people are involved? What drugs are using? Where are they using? What neighborhoods are most deeply involved? And, and so forth. And so uh, an initial effort of the mayor's substance abuse task force is to collect data. So once we have this data, we can develop better strategies and follow, follow, them over, follow those benchmarks over time to see if we are making a difference. Otherwise, we're doing things with good intentions, not knowing for sure if they're working, and hoping, hoping that we can make changes in, in, in our community in a positive way down the road. Next, we take a look at the EVSC's Extended Daycare Center. Hello, my name is Carlotta Patterson and I'm the director over the EVSC Extended Day Center. Today I welcome you to Delaware Elementary School, which is one of our sites that hosts our Extended Day Center program before and after school. Before school, our main goal is to prepare our students for their education. This can consist of our staff helping students with homework. Uh, we may help with breakfast duty and help the students get breakfast to make sure they are fed before their day of education. Or a student just may need a hug and we're there to provide that for them to make sure that they get through their day. When the students go to their classrooms, we want to make sure that they are ready to learn. After school, our main goal is to continue to support the students and their families. After school, a typical day may consist of a, a snack that we provide for the students. Uh, we also provide homework help for them. And then they may have an opportunity for some crafts or other recreational activities that are centered around character building and some student learning activities that they can share in. In addition to before and after school services, we also provide a summer camp to our EVSC students in grades K through 6. During this time, we provide opportunities for field trips and recreational activities that are centered around character and leadership building, um, recreational activities, physical fitness, as well as student learning in the community. The Extended Day Center partners with several community organizations to provide educational op opportunities for our children. Action Pest Control visits many of our centers introducing our children to the world of bugs. The fire stations visit our schools providing fire safety and insight into their career. The Vander Vandenberg Humane Society teaches our children about animals and community service. Each time the Vandenberg Humane Society visits one of our centers, the children collect items to donate to the animals at the shelter. This is a great opportunity to teach our children about giving back to their community. The Thunderbolt hockey team also visits our centers to teach the children about the game of hockey. These are just a few of the community partners who make an impact on our children at the extended day centers. At EVSC, we have 20 extended day center sites. They are located at all of our elementary schools, our K through six schools, and two of our K through eight schools. At all of our centers, in the morning, we have 607 students who participate in our before school care, and we have 1,020 students that participate in our after school program. In order to participate in the extended day center program, you must be a student at EVSC. In our last segment, senior reporter David Bland meets with EVSC's superintendent, Dr. David Smith, to discuss the process of determining when to cancel school due to weather concerns, as well as the options the EVSC has to make up the missed days. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Smith. We're interested in learning how EVSC comes to a decision on whether or not to cancel or delay school because of weather. Um, I know it must be a tricky situation because it's really, you know, you have a lot of people a lot in this community that's uh, wanting to hear from you in this situation. Sure, and you know, it's really one of those decisions that that's a no-win situation. No matter what we decide, somebody's not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. And I know that in the past years it's kind of been different, but how does EVSC really come to the decision of whether or not to cancel or delay school? It really is a very involved process uh, with a lot of individuals. We do many things from studying the weather forecast to actually contacting the National Weather Service out of Paducah to driving the roads and then to having that conference call to making the final decision. And you have a team that actually goes out and drives these roads to you know, test if it's safe or not. Do you happen to know what part of Evansville they drive? 
Sure, we have six individuals that start driving at three in the morning and Vanderbilt County is about 240 square miles so every one of the six individuals has a specific route to drive and we check not only road conditions but also conditions of bridges and overpasses as well as sidewalks, school parking lots and the conditions at the schools themselves. Is there a protocol on how soon um, you can actually cancel or delay the school? You know, a lot of that is really dependent upon the weather. We don't like to operate off of forecasts very often because in southern Indiana, the joke is if you don't like the weather today, just wait, it'll change tomorrow. And while the forecasts have become much more sophisticated, we still don't have necessarily 100% certainty. So we don't like to cancel school on the forecast. There are occasions where everything is in alignment and we know that we're going to get hit with a storm. But what we do is um, take the weather forecast into consideration. And then if, for instance, if we do have inclement weather and we know that the temperatures are going to be certainly below zero and significantly below zero, then the likelihood of chemicals working on the streets are greatly reduced. And I think what everybody has to also bear in mind is that our parking lots are very important to us because we don't want any of our students or adults to slip or fall on the parking lot as well as the sidewalks. So we take many, many things into consideration. Typically, when is the public actually notified that the EVSC, all the schools, have been canceled or delayed? We try to make that decision by 5 o'clock so that we can notify media and then also the rest of our community partners. And then we send the text message and emails out to our parents and then notify folks in the media. So we have buses that typically start rolling around 5.30 in the morning, uh, which is very, very early. Uh, so we want to make that call uh, certainly before or at 5 o'clock. And besides the drivers going out and testing whether or not it's safe, are there any other things that you guys do to make sure that it is like 100% safe to go to school? We do have a phenomenal facilities group. Uh, we have snow plows, we have de-icers, we have uh, the individual schools have their snow plows, snow blowers and salt and those types of uh, remedies. But uh, in addition to our own uh, workforce, you know, we also have to be certain that uh, no one would slide into our buses. Uh, it may be fairly um, good road conditions, perhaps on the southern side of our county, but the northern side of the county could be treacherous. So we have to take all that in consideration. It's not just our buses, not just our adults driving, but when we put 20 uh, 3,000 students and 3,400 employees out into the streets, we clog the streets also. So if we're not uh, driving on that particular morning, then it basically is safer for everyone else also. So let's say only part of the county or part um, has been affected by the weather. Have you guys ever considered actually just canceling uh, that side of the county or, or instead of the whole county in general? You know, it's a great question. Uh, we have not done that yet because uh, the conditions that warrant canceling school in one part of the county could certainly move into another part of the county. Um, and also we have students that travel in the middle of the day with our Southern Indiana Career and Tech Center with Bossy's IB program, with the Med Professions Academy at Central and Harrison Shepherd Academy. We have an early college models. We have a lot of movements during the middle of the day. So it really would not be, a, I think, a wise thing on our part for us to cancel school for part of the district and then to have classes for the other part. So I know there's been a lot of cancellations this year, but there actually hasn't been any delays this year. How does that kind of come into play? You know, we haven't delayed. We can delay for an hour or we could delay up to two hours. But what we do is when we consider having school or not, certainly we, we try to go to school every day we possibly can. The next question is, do we think conditions would be improved significantly enough in a one hour or two hour window? And what we find often is that the temperature conditions are not going to be elevated to the extent that it would provide any freezing or uh, thawing. Um, now, in conditions such as fog and things like that, then I think that's probably where we could utilize a one or two hour delay, but, but really when we uh, look at using a delay, much of it with snow certainly and ice is predicated upon the temperature and typically uh, that has not worked in our favor. So Dr. Smith, we know that um, with the cancellations and delays with it, it must, you know, it comes with makeup work. Can you kind of talk about what we really 
do to decide on what to do? Like if it's virtually that we make it up, if it's virtually, or if we maybe add on an extra hour to each day, what do we kind of do for that? Sure, well when we uh, cancel school, then we do have to make those days up. And really there are two mechanisms in place to do that. One is to use a previously scheduled makeup day, and then the other is to utilize a virtual day. Um, and the decision on what to use really is based upon how quickly can we get that day into the school routine because we'd like to keep the days that we missed in the same quarter that we missed them. So if we have um, a makeup day in that same quarter that it's not too far out then we'll try to utilize that. If not then we'll use a virtual day and we get that thing closer to the actual day that was missed. So this year we haven't added on the extra time onto the actual school day like we did in years past. Um, how does adding on the extra hours and not going that route, how does that come into play? You know, great question. Indiana has a requirement of 180 student attendance days, so that occurred, uh, the provision of adding an hour to uh, the, each remaining day or until the, the days were made up. I think back in the ice storm that we had around 2008 or 2009, that was a provision because there was widespread uh, severe weather in Indiana. So we actually have to receive permission from the Department of Education in order to do that. And, and since that time, they've not allowed that kind of latitude. How did EVSC receive the waiver for the seventh snow day that we had not that long ago? This year, IDOE did allow school corporations to waive one day if they made up the six previous days. It, this winter was not as, quite as severe as when we had the ice storm, so that's why they allowed this provision and did not go any further than that. Okay, and we have a lot of virtual days, and with those virtual assignments, how do we monitor, or how does a school corporation monitor if that's efficient? You know, each virtual attendance day has to be made up officially with a designated day that the assignments are due. So we monitor that be, by the requirements that IDOE puts forth, and so every student then is required to turn in the assignments, and teachers are required to put that in their gradebook by a specific day. So we actually count the attendance by whether or not the student has turned in the assignment and the teacher has recorded a grade. So then we look at the efficiency of whether that virtual day was, was worthwhile by looking at the number of students that turned in assignments and their letter grades. Has the virtual days that we've had this year been effective? Well, we look at the effectiveness of those days by looking at the number of students that turned their work in and also the letter grades that they received for the work that they did turn in. And we basically then take that into consideration when we look at the balance of virtual days as well as making up days through the standard process. Um, and what we've seen in the, is the last few years that the virtual days are basically on par with our makeup days, so we don't want to discount that, but we also don't want to use strictly virtual days or strictly uh, the traditional makeup day. We like to use a balance, and as long as students are turning the work in and are getting good grades for that, then we'll continue to use a balance of those days. And speaking of virtual attendance, how is that going? You know, it, it is a little bit less than our regular attendance days, but not significantly less. Is there anything else that you would like to add to this discussion? Well, we do appreciate the latitude that the Indiana Department of Education provides all school districts in Indiana. And, uh, you know, we continue to utilize the virtual days. We continue to utilize our makeup days that are on the calendar. And we do think that that provides the best experience possible for our students. Well, you have a great responsibility um, upon you, and we just want to thank you for the commitment and dedication to our community, and thank you for the time that you're taking out to talk with us. Thank you. You're very welcome, and I want to add that I have a phenomenal team that does this work with me, so it certainly isn't me, but a lot of people uh, participate in making the decision of whether or not to have school or, or cancel because of inclement weather. Reporting from EVSC Central Office for Bossy's EVSC Community Link, I'm David Bland. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to see other stories from our vault, visit the link on the screen. Tune in next month for a new episode of Bossy's EVSC Community Link. We would like to extend a special thanks to the following businesses and organizations for providing their services. Gerald and Leanne Scott, Sharon Adams with Timeless Photography in the Acropolis Mediterranean Restaurant.
This has been a Bulldog Production.